Hello and welcome to the Future of Strategy webinar on economic power. Is, it, is, is economic power the new hard power and can trade recover from its use as a weapon of choice? The ultimate question, of course, is, is trade decoupling and is technology decoupling as a result of the trade war and trade conflict between the US and China? With me to discuss some of these really important issues, I have an absolutely fantastic panel. Um, and I'd like to introduce Deborah Elms, who is the founder and executive di director of the Asian Trade Center. Andy Burwell, who is the international trade and investment director at the CBI. Um, I'd like to introduce Joanna Kernings, who's a senior economist and international trade analyst at ING. And finally, Mr. Ian Anderson, who is the executive chairman of Cicero AMO. We have a vast amount of experience, understanding and expertise in this panel. My, my, my goal is to say as little as possible, but maybe, um, Deborah, if I turn to you first and ask, and ask this, has there been a shift in national security strategies from a focus on military security actually to economic security over the last few years? And what does that mean in terms of um, Asian trade and in terms of US and Asian um, relationships? It's a great question. So yes, uh, this, yes and no, I guess I would say. So we've, we've always had uh, folks who have argued that economics are an extension of politics and an extension of security strategy. And particularly, we used to see it around sanctions policy and that was like the tip of the sphere, if you were, will in the economic space. But over the last couple of years, particularly under the Trump administration, they have, at least many people would argue, weaponized trade as another tool for confronting all sorts of issues, whether they're military or they're strategic or they're political, kind of doesn't matter. The Trump, the Trump administration went after both allies and adversaries with a lot of different trade tools, the most famous of which is the use of tariffs uh, on inbound products into the United States from a wide variety of countries, including its most important trading partners, Canada, uh, the, the European Union, and its, its countries that it views as an adversary, in particular China. And so we've seen a lot of that happen. That is allowed for, you can have national security exceptions, but we have never seen so many things that have gotten thrown into that national security basket. And the one that I would point to before, before I, I stop talking for right now is the Trump administration at one time threatened automotives uh, as a national security threat coming in, particularly from Japan or from Germany. Uh, and so somehow your imported Toyota was assumed to be some kind of national security threat. So I think this highlights for me at least, the degree to which we, we, we merged national security arguments at least with economic and trade issues uh, under the Trump administration. And of course the question everyone is asking, is this going to continue under a Biden administration come January? And the answer is just to give you my quick answer, somewhat. So we won't see autos as a threat, but we are going to continue to see national security arguments made, but more hopefully with more nuance, more subtlety and more target uh, against different kinds of, of countries and different kinds of products. So, I mean, that's really interesting. And it's it's a fantastic summary of what's what's been going on. It's this kind of obsession with the trade deficit has turned into the need to see that as a major grievance against which this whole national security agenda has been has been brought into place. So tariffs have actually been used almost as a coercive tool, haven't they, to, to alter behaviours. What, what, what do you see in Asia as a result of all of that? Well, I think we see more country, uh, several things. One is we see more countries who say, I have lots of things that I want to do. And in particular, I have lots of protection that I want to impose at home. And so if I can, if the US can use national security arguments for doing whatever it wants to, then I can certainly use national security arguments for doing whatever I want to. And in particular, we're starting to see it most uh, obviously around a few sectors, food, so sort of national security, food security becomes uh, restrictions on food, clearly in the medical space, uh, personal protective equipment, et cetera. Um, and increasingly, 
uh, and ahead will be digital and everything related to the digital economy, technology, et cetera. So we have a couple different areas where many countries are watching what the US does and are, if not imitating, at least reflecting on how they might use the same kinds of arguments or the same kinds of logic in order to do different kinds of things that they would like uh, that used to be considered less acceptable, uh, if, if either unacceptable or at least less acceptable. Uh, but now is, is apparently fair game according to what everyone has watched over the last few years in particular. I, th I think one of the things that's interesting for me, and maybe Ian, you'd like to come in on this, is, is the fact that um, the President-elect Biden has talked about um, national security being economic security. So he's very much played along that lines, hasn't he, to say this is actually not going to change. And yet foreign policy isn't really his big thing at the moment, is it? Trade policy is not going to be his, his first hundred days, is it? Well, it might be, uh, Rebecca. I mean, you know, I, you know, I did direct everybody to uh, build back uh, better .gov as it now is, given the fact that it can be .gov um, uh, and no longer uh, .com, given the fact that um, Trump has signaled that a transition can begin. And I think it's a good place to start because, look, you know, Trump has, as Deborah was saying, Trump has changed the international dynamic. Uh, Biden has had to talk about American workers first. That was a huge theme for um, uh, Trump in, in 2016. It worked for him and to a large extent to win back uh, Pennsylvania and all the other states that flipped to Trump in, um, in 2016, Biden's had to move on to this turf. So what, what has that meant? That you know, he's talking about a domestic agenda, and I think that's what you're asking me, you know, domestic agenda before trade, but a domestic agenda which says, let's use the American supply chain as much as possible. Let's use stuff that's made in America and American workers as much as possible. But what he's also talking about, and now starting to see his cabinet picks, you know, looking at people like Anthony Blinken as his, Secretary of State, who absolutely uh, believe in the rules-based world order, want America to plug back in to the rules-based uh, world, world order. Um, the question is, of course, will he alone um, in the White House be able to do that with a Congress that he may or may not be able to control? And we're, you know, we're still waiting to the first week of January to see whether or not um, at least he might get the Senate in equity and use the uh, Kamala Harris vice presidential vote to be able to uh, do trade deals um, um, al along the way. But, I mean, I I'd like to take us back to, uh, without getting too philosophical, um, well before Trump, you know, the contours of using um, a, a different set of levers started really as a result of, of what happened in Iraq. You know, you look at the desire of Western governments to, to then to want to intervene, to be able to intervene. Syria, of course, being the most redolent example of this, has, has meant that there's just been an entire shift in terms of the levers which politicians in the West have been able to pull. Uh, and um, that's come at the same time as the impact of austerity on ordinary voters' uh, lives. So those two crashing forces, uh, really over the past you know, 10, 15 years, not just the past four, I think have fundamentally reshaped all of this. So I think that's incredibly um, insightful to say, actually, what we're in, the situation that we're in, and we haven't had any disagreement on this over the last few days in all of our sessions, we're actually seeing now an acceleration of processes that have been in place for a very long time. And Andy, maybe I could ask you this. It's Ian's point really is that um, Iraq started things. So maybe what we've seen is almost a reluctance to start to get involved in really big military conflicts. So actually that has shifted did 
the domain of conflict into um, into a more business space, into a more trade space, because it doesn't mean body bags coming back as much. You know, it's it's more about it's more about economic levers and and tariff levers and so on. They're still deeply political because obviously mm. sanctions are deeply political. How does business cope? In, in this ever shifting landscape, what 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 are the key things that businesses find, and, and you hear from the business space on this? So I suppose it's you know I'm going to add a bit, a bit to what, what Ian was saying. Uh, I think it's also a case of uh, the, the, just the, the nature of of business and kind of a global trading system now, um, in, in terms of being able to reach. Uh, you know, into different communities, into different countries, uh, through a business lens, through finance, through so many different ways. Um, economic levers are are just more effective often than actually moving big bits of grey metal around the world. So actually, you know, if you're um, looking at you know the um, the handprints of China in Africa or, or, or Russia in South America, you know, there 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 are tentacles now of of different countries in the West and the East all over the world which didn't exist. Uh, as much before, uh, and actually they can be pulled uh, and, and moved around. Um, in terms of of business and and what we kind of see, um, so I suppose um, this kind of shift towards economic security uh, has a number of kind of implications for for trade and investment. Um, so I think on trade, obviously, we've seen it, a huge shift in in protectionism. Um, if you just look at the um, the inbound flows for for the G. 20, uh, I think it's gone from like um, tariffs have been applied to from 0.7% of imports in 2008 to about 10% today. It's a huge shift uh, of kind of protectionist measures. And obviously, we've seen that uh, during COVID as well. Um, and, and that is a towards it to a degree a, a national security play. Um, and there are obviously uh, other, other, other aspects to that as well in terms of kind of geopolitical tensions uh, which come into force. And, and what Deborah was saying about Trump in the US uh, is obviously a, a good example of that. Um, in terms of what, what that will potentially uh, kind of look like going forward, I think probably increased partnerships, uh, increased uh, focus on uh, building consensus. You know, whether whether Biden looks towards multilateralism, um, you know, uh, the, the uh, proposed Secretary of State, uh, obviously is a French speaker, um, you know, European ties, um, that there is a, you know, it may not be a complete shift back towards, um, you know, using the WTO and, and fully integrating, uh, because I still think there is uh, both Democratic and Republican in the US um, hesitation on the WTO. But certainly um, th there's potential for, for greater consensus building kind of going forward. And that's quite important for business, I think, because it provides a degree of certainty if, if kind of global powers can kind of come together. Um, I think from a business point of view, the key thing is that um, business need to be involved in kind of shaping the approach um, of, of kind of uh, geopolitical strategies and, and the, the use of um, kind of economic levers, um, both uh, in terms of trying to avoid them being protectionist, because there's different ways of looking at this. Um, you know, there could be better use of UK export finance facilities to more effectively target um, you know, areas where, where countries perhaps want to, to build a, a better consensus uh, and businesses can kind of follow that uh, in a, you know, not a tied trade and aid way, but in terms of a, um, a combined economic strategy with an aid strategy and, uh, and kind of uh, other, other domestic approaches. Um, and I think that that kind of uh, business being involved in, in the shaping as well as the delivery of economic um, strategies is something which um, I think will increase uh, and is, is definitely not new, um, but it was certainly something I think we'll, we'll see uh, increasing. And the final point is probably on investment. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've just been talking a little bit about the fact that um, you know, investing in the US is, has been a little bit tricky over the last few years and from a national security perspective, national security and investment bill um, is just at its second reading uh, in the UK, Houses of Parliament. Um, you know, I think globally we're seeing more um, awareness of, of where investment comes from, the raise of, of uh, anti-money laundering, all those sort of, of factors. Uh, and I think that will increase. Uh, and it's the, the question of to what degree.
I, I guess as well that raises some very important economic points about about the impact of all of this and maybe Joanna would like to come in on that because um, you know we are seeing this shift we are seeing a shift in the basis of public spending around the world this debate I mean we've seen it today in the UK uh, with the Chancellor's statement we've you know the, the shift um, of Covid has actually altered um, the way in which governments are thinking as well, focusing back budgets on national national interests, health systems, and so on, but also um, rebalancing some of the areas around military expenditure versus aid expenditure versus economic expenditure as well. So we are seeing some kind of shifting landscape. Um, Jana, what, what do you think are the, are the sort of broader geoeconomic consequences of what's going on at the moment? Well, just on your last point about um, governments just reassessing the balance of things, I think one important um, concern that we haven't seen governments really take in hand, uh, at least recently, is uh, supply chain resilience. And it's striking that that is part of buildbackbetter.gov. Um, the, the, um, thanks to the timing of the presidential campaign, um, that suddenly has become a central theme uh, that um, perhaps um, critical products might be identified centrally uh, by a government even and stockpiled so that um, these globalized supply chains wouldn't need to uh, you know deliver in time or, or, or be the be the uh, backup plan for for countries and I don't I don't think I've seen that so prevalent um, until COVID, you know, really made us realise where, where things come from. Um, but on your point about shifts, bigger shifts, I think um, we've seen the EU start to be sort of torn between the, the two poles of China and the US, um, threatened um, by the auto tariffs, uh, subject to its own steel and aluminium tariffs, um, retaliating against those tariffs. and in the EU's uh, way, it has uh, it really um, been, uh, uh, it's tried to be a kind of champion of rules-based trade, even while retaliating against those, those tariffs. So it's really tried to find uh, the letter of the law to back it up. Um, but um, it, it, even as it tries to, to be this representative of rules-based trade, it's not above using ongoing trade negotiations as, um, uh, to, to further its own political ends. And we see this in its, um, its negotiations with Mercosur um, uh, uh, for a trade deal where um, it's, it, uh, it sees it as an opportunity to have a dialogue with Brazil about, uh, about the Amazon rainforest uh, stay. And it is also um, looking to Indonesia and thinking that the uh, prospects of a trade deal might not be so bright while pal pal um, oil um, plantations continue to be such an important um, crop there. So really kind of, yeah, really getting involved in a detailed way about uh, other economies and other uh, economic decisions um, with trade as, as the kind of leverage. Um, and I think that we, we see um, the sort of victim of, of the political forces everywhere that have, have uh, led um, governments, or particularly uh, Trump, to respond to kind of populist forces uh, calling for free trade to be curbed or um, in, in EU countries in the Netherlands struggling to ratify CETA. Um, you know, that, that it's, it's connected and it's going to be uh, kind of in the front of politicians' minds here. Um, even as they they stand between the US and China, and I think that the like one of the last things um, I'll mention is that um, in terms of throwing their their weight behind one or the other, um, uh, the US or China, the the EU has along with Japan joined the US in, at the WTO in the US's dispute with China about intellectual property practices. So that's a really it's a it's a really um, sort of striking kind of declaration of where they stand. Uh, it's not um, it's not to endorse some of the uh, U.S.'s trade policy on on tariffs and and the use of national security arguments for the steel and aluminium tariffs, but in some senses they do agree with the U.S. that uh, that a dispute should be raised against China, and that's playing out now at the WTO, except in W. 
WTO times, so quite slowly. Um, so that's where the, the, the power shifts and the EU has been caught in between. Can I come back on something that Joanna just said? Sorry, Rebecca. Yeah, uh, just it's an interesting point on the FTA side of things uh, and, and kind of climate change and sustainability. I think that kind of um, illustrates the, the point I was making earlier around um, actually the, uh, the, the strength of trade as a, a political lever, not just a national security lever. Uh, the fact that you know, free trade agreements now aren't just about trade. There are so many things kind of layered into them, which which make them very complicated, very lengthy uh, documents and, and hard to negotiate. And I think increasingly uh, sustainability and, and climate is going to be um, a provision which is is um, fundamental. But that can, then does leak into obviously national security. So if you look at what's important to services, UK is services based economy, something which is really integral, I think, for our trade agreement with the US is uh, labor mobility. Um, and the ability for, for staff to move around the world. Obviously, there are national security connotations to that as well. Um, so if you enter into a, a CPTPP or, a, you know, a, a, a plurilateral uh, agreement, the things like mobility provisions uh, are going to be increasingly politicised. Uh, and that's going to have an impact, I think, on, um, on the ability of A to get those over the line, but also B, on the understanding of, um, you know, how... I suppose national security and, and uh, things like mobility kind of into play. I think I think there's there's so much to unpack there, and I think if I had to summarise it, it would be in terms of you know the the complexity of trade deals and the complexity of of, of the relationships is actually reflecting the economic nationalism that we've talked about, also the threats to national security, which obviously now is also about health. So um, I mean the the whole the whole area of COVID has actually, as you said, Jana, made us realise how important these supply chains are. We saw inventories collapse we saw um we saw manufacturing stop we saw you know the heads of jaguar land rover go charging off to beijing with their suitcases to pick up components and you know a apart from that we've also seen 94 countries impose tariff restrictions on COVID-19 related products um, in order to make sure that their own population is safe. So, I mean, this is this is something that's gone beyond Trump, isn't it, Deborah? It's something that's gone beyond um, the whole scope of um, US-China trade wars because it's actually gone everywhere. It's broken down the European Union. How is it, are we seeing the same things in Asia? No. <laughs> I mean, yes, a little bit, but no, because, um... You know, I don't know what y'all paid attention to over the last week, but I have been nonstop on the signature of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So yeah. 15 economies in Asia uh, all just signed a trade agreement last Sunday, uh, which I think is crucial for a number of reasons. One is it, it obviously is about economic integration in the region, and it comes in the wake of these tensions that we've just been discussing. And so I think what is what is fascinating and there are many things that are fascinating, but one thing that's fascinating about the signature of RCEP now is despite all of the headwinds from COVID, from a trade war, from challenges at the domestic level, from pressures for protectionism in some markets, they still have managed finally to come together and sign a comprehensive uh, you know, it's 510 pages of text and thousands of pages of schedules, uh, commitments to one another on market opening. And they did so because, among other things, uh, they wanted supply chains to work in Asia for Asia. And so I think important in this region is the effort still in Asia to stay integrated, even when, and, and I think this is also striking, we had China, Japan, and Korea, as an example, sitting together in RCEP. Uh, despite the fact that in other settings they couldn't even be in the same room together, you know, so during the during the part of our RCEP negotiations, South Korea and Japan refused to sit next to each other in different kinds of venues, but across the RCEP talks, eight years they literally sat side by side because it's alphabetical and it was you know Japan Korea, uh, and so they were right next to each other, and I think that is a hopeful sign. Um, about the potential for integration in Asia. And if I could just follow up on something that, that Andy said about trade agreements and other things that are not trade related that keep getting stuffed into trade agreements. Um, sustainability and climate, I know is a huge objective in Europe. 
it is not a huge objective in a lot of Asia. And so if we are going to start loading up trade agreements with all non-trade objectives like labor, like the environment, and crucially, if we start to make them legally binding, you will find fewer of those agreements, I think, because governments in Asia, it's not that they're anti-environment, let me be clear, they're not necessarily out there to kill everyone, but their priorities are different. And the idea that somehow Asia needs to level up to, to Europe standards on sustainability and climate, I think is gonna be deeply problematic. And so we are, we are already seeing these issues. Uh, I think Joanna pointed out, you know, issues EU, Indonesia over palm oil, also with Malaysia over palm oil. It, it's, it's difficult, it's really difficult when you start thinking about, yes, there are trade related implications of climate change rules, of sustainability rules, but how, how collectively can we tackle those? I think that that's unclear at the moment. I, I think it's really interesting. Go back to the point Joanna made about the EU Mercosur arrangements that a lot those failed to go ahead because for the same reason that you're talking about Asia here, which is that um, that, that, that Brazil said actually it's deeply imperialistic for the West Europe to start imposing those types of standards on um, onto um, us because we're emerging economies. We've got things to do first before we before we start engaging with all of these things. And you can think what you like about all of that but again it goes back to um, the complexity of how we are seeing trade negotiations and you know the US deal with the UK is incredibly complicated anything that the European Union does is going to have sustainability in it and um, Joe Biden of course is talking about um, using tariffs not as a coercive weapon but as a weapon for sustainability so that's going to have effects on Asia as well isn't it I assume so. I mean, you know, one of the things that Asia has to face that I don't think it's ready for uh, is Europe's Green New Deal, and in particular, carbon border adjustment measures that Europe will have to impose to create a level playing field. And I don't think Asia or a lot of firms in Asia, of course, it's a big place with a lot of diversity, but I don't think a lot of Asian firms yet have recognized what a climate border tax in Europe will do for their production in Asia and how that will potentially transform supply chains to be, and I know the Europeans want it to be in favor of Europe, but I think it's equally likely to see supply chains say, screw it, we're out of Europe. It's too difficult, it's too expensive. Those taxes are too complicated. We will start producing for not Europe. And if the Americans continue to be crazy, then we just won't produce for, for the US either. And we'll end up with sort of an inadvertent um, reduction in where things go and it'll be, you know, blocks. Like we used to talk about, you know, I'm older than I want to be, but we used to talk about the creation of economic blocks uh, and then that sort of didn't happen. And now you can imagine, or at least I can imagine them coming back again and they come back again for technology reasons, uh, but they come back again for other kinds of things like could be climate, could be sustainability, could be standards, could be, differing views on, on the importance of labor or human rights. There's a lot of ways in which I can imagine blocks developing that we hadn't anticipated even just a few short years ago. So Ian, we're seeing decoupling because we're seeing the, um, the, the sort of agglomeration of trading nations into groups. We're seeing decoupling because we're seeing technology separate out because of US trade policy and actually not, not necessarily just trade policy. I'd say we've seen industrial policy weaponized as well. Um, and we're seeing it now potentially also this decoupling around sustainability grounds. Where does the world go from here? So, um... If Biden is serious uh, and his new Secretary of State is serious about plugging uh, America back into the world order, plugging back into the Paris Agreement, having a deeper relationship with the European Union um, and everything else that it kind of flows from that um, approach. Um, if he gets traction, I think, you know, potentially we're at a in, we could be at an inflection point. Now, he's got COVID to deal with, which, you know, by the time we get to the midterms and, you know, rather tragically watching the coverage of the American election that we were all glued to uh, before we even heard uh, the results, uh, the commentators were already moving on to 2022 because they do, because there's a little industry um, that is uh, 
based on what the next election looks like. But if he gets traction, if America can bounce back, and America's, uh, you know, because of its dynamics, probably got the best chance globally of uh, bouncing back faster than most major economies because of its, uh, uh, because of its structure. Um, is there the glue to be able to create a conversation that frankly has been probably parked for far too long, which is, does the 1945 settlement work anymore? Do the institutions, uh, there's a massive debate that we've been having um, also on this call about WTO. There's a, 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 an ongoing conversation about the, uh, the UN and its structure. Um, and for the very reasons that, you know, Deborah and, and, and Andy and Jan have been pointing to, to so far, um, the, you know, the Biden presidency is talking about green, it's talking about equality, it's talking about economic recovery, and it's talking about dealing with COVID. Now, in the West, you know, already the Johnson administration in the UK, uh, Macron in France, um, Germany, um, et cetera, et cetera. They're all leaning into that agenda really quickly. They're leaning into that agenda. As Deborah says, we're not necessarily seeing that anywhere else. Um, and I mean, I chaired a conversation the other day uh, with the UK Secretary of Trade uh, and the Australian um, uh, High Commissioner. I mean, literally just two or three days after that, that deal had been and signed. And it was, it was you know, the, 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 what we are talking about was all over that conversation. Um, the UK Minister wanted to talk about a values-based trade policy. The Australian High Commissioner nodded along to a values-based trade policy, but they've just signed a deal with China, yeah? Um, so, you know, I, I think overlaid over all of this, Rebecca, in terms of um, what business has to deal with, what trade policy has to deal with, is going to be this tension between pragmatism and values. Uh, all the way through this, and who's going to win out in that, and I think my kind of final comment at this stage is, uh, sorry, if I can go back one question to where we started, which is actually that, that you know, in, in many ways, as the West is using economic rather than traditional military levers, you know, is China starting to use both? You know, we've seen moments when China has been using um, uh, military power more than it has ever done in our in our lifetime. Everybody keeps a look on Hong Kong as the litmus test for um, you know beyond trade policy, pure and hard um, uh, legal force in terms of its wider sphere of of, uh, of uh, ambit, but whether or not uh, you know, and, and you I know keep an eye on this in terms of um, the impact of Chinese military spending. Whether or not actually the principal in, interlocutor in the East is um, is is going to continue to ramp up further. So I, I do think we're at a crossroads moment in terms of how these forces wash across the trade conversation. So I'd agree completely, you know I would, and I think I think um, the issue as much as anything else is the fact that we've seen technology shift to such an extent. Um, we've seen um, also a COVID pandemic which has altered the way in which we see our own countries and see our place in the world. I mean in the UK as well we've seen Brexit and we'll come back back to that shortly but 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 the issue then becomes against that environment where everything is uncertain where they seem to be you know the landscape of trade is shifting tectonically so that trade deals do include so much more than just um just free trade 
in those circumstances, the role of the nation state has changed, hasn't it? And the role of us identifying with, um, you know, what our values are and how we articulate those has changed fundamentally. So it means that we can't actually we can't actually behave in the way that we used to in terms of multilateralism. And I think I think the issue with China and, and maybe um, maybe Deborah or Andy would like to come in on this rather than me. But the issue with China is that they're creating a new type of a new type of of existential competition let's call it a competition because everybody prefers the word competition to conflict but it's a new type of competition isn't it it's about how um about about how power can be generated in terms of just accumulated economic power economic technology it's about finance as well and how all of this moves around the world which means that military is then backing up all of that power but in china war and peace can coexist um, so, um, you know, conflict and stability can coexist. So military build up and economic peace can co coexist. Um, so, I, I mean, for me, it's all about the shifting role of the nation state. It's about strategic competition and where we go from there. And, and, and Joanna, I'd say, where, where does the EU sit within all of this? Because it's playing happy families while the US is playing chess and China's playing Go. I think you're on mute. I don't know if one of the others wanted to come in on, um, on go for it on the, your earlier comment about okay. Um, I think so. The EU is having to stand up to China in its own way, and it's um, it's doing this with with two key things at the moment, but with a lot of worrying behind the scenes on all other fronts. And I think the, the key things we've seen are the use of. Um, enforcing its procurement rules against some of the the belt and road initiative projects that have entered into eu countries uh, so at first um the port of piraeus in greece with uh, became a majority chinese um owned port and the uh the vision then was to connect um ports um pretty much with a high-speed railroad north from there uh but that has founded on EU litigation against uh, uh, China procuring its own uh, workers and, and firms to, to do those projects. So I think that's an example of the EU has some things in place that it is, is prepared to use in order to try and behave strategically. <laughs> um, uh, but it's doing that a kind of project by project um, level. Uh, the other thing that the EU has done is to try and um, uh, work more strategically against um, uh, investment uh, into key assets. So something like what we uh, what we see in the US, where uh, Chinese investment has just been blocked um, in, in into the US uh, last year, thanks to um, a, again a kind of definitional thing about what is what is a strategic asset. Um, if if it is such an asset, then we can just say no, just, just based on where the investor comes from. And um, I think that the EU has, now has its own procurement, um, it, sorry, its own investment screening um, policy. That's, that's a kind of toughening up of its stance, uh, particularly against China. It doesn't name China, but it's definitely designed for China. I think I think that goes back to the point we were all making earlier, which is the role of industrial policy, isn't it? So, so Andy, maybe um, because you're you're um, speaking um, from the CBI, this is really important, isn't it? Every single country has identified industrial policy as a way of uh, becoming more competitive in a very competitive export trade landscape. Um, it means that industrial policy itself is weaponized. So we've got Made in China 2025. We've got Got, um, we've got the, the Germany's Industry 4.0, we've got um, industrial policy levelling up here, industrial policy, actually policies towards technology and technology partnerships in the US being handled by the Department of Commerce and not by the US trade negotiator, so trade representatives. So in actual fact, it's industrial policy, everything's shifting, this complexity is shifting into industrial policy, that has massive consequences, doesn't it? Um, yes, uh, yeah, no, I, I do I agree with the, the term weaponization of industrial policy. I'm not sure I do. I think it's probably a, a bit of a stretch. Uh, but no, I think that, you know, the, uh, the importance of, uh, of trade 
supply chains uh, in terms of uh, you know, a nation's competitiveness on the global stage, its, its ability to influence uh, and to shape global standards uh, is increasing. You know, the, the UK will have to look um, ahead to you know, um, 2025 and, and beyond 2030 at the strategic sectors that we want to be competitive in. You know, we already are, look at semiconductors, you know, Taiwan ourselves, you know, that there, are, there are certain hubs and, and certain um, you know, industries where, where the UK can lead. But you know, as, as we've heard, um, the UK will need to have, for instance, an industrial policy, uh, you know, a, a reskilling agenda. Uh, which will will naturally lead to it building um, new industries which are, are kind of globally competitive. Um, is that a, a form of uh, of protectionism? Uh, I'm not sure it is. I think it's a form of um, uh, ensuring that you are um, you are strate strategically competitive on a, on a global stage. Um, and that there, I think we're seeing this as well a little bit in um, on the WTO. Uh, so the, the JSI, the joint initiatives on things like e-commerce, on, on services agreements, potentially next year on biodiversity. Um, th these are agreements that are, um, you know, because the WTO can't agree on anything and they can't you know, come to consensus on anything. These are kind of 80, 90 countries coming together uh, to, to try and set a standard which will um, you know, be implemented by those countries and the UK has signed up to all of them, um, which will then you know, flow into that, will flow investment. Uh, and that will then drive other countries to adopt those standards. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's the use of, uh, of trade policy um, to drive influence and, um, uh, and kind of adoption of, uh, of certain, I suppose, economic principles and values um, globally. So yeah, certainly, I, you know, um, I think you know, the, um, the use of domestic policy uh, to ensure that, that countries can be uh, internationally competitive, strategically competitive in the future um, will, will certainly be a, a key agenda, I think, during the recovery and this Build Back Better kind of mantra. Um, so there's a question coming in from the audience that actually links really nicely to that, which is, um, which is that, um, that the, the, the RCEP looks like um, it's a little bit weaker on, on, digital, um, on digital agreements. Um, what, what do you think about that, De Deborah? Is it, a, is, it, is it a fact or is it, was it deliberate? Was it left out? I mean, it goes to the point about complexity on trade negotiations, complexity in terms of national, national strategies around all this area, but also whether or not it undermines the power of, of RCEP in the first place. Well, I would say that the digital rules are a missed opportunity in Asia and one that is personally still killing me because we spent, I spent 17 different rounds at RCEP talking to officials about why they needed to be ambitious on digital and why it is that you can't have an agreement that's built for the future without good digital rules of good, you know, small size, small value shipments for small companies about services trade about payments, because there's no point in doing digital if you can't get paid. And then crucially, in order to do all of that, you needed to have information and you need to deal with information flows. And sadly, and annoyingly, at the end, we lost some of the big ones. So you will see that the RCEP has a commitment on cross-border data flows, and it has a commitment to say, you, you may not require, you may not mandate data to be housed locally. But in both of those cases in RCEP, the next paragraph says, except in cases when you know, there are particular interests, national security, public health, et cetera, you know, exceptions. But even worse in RCEP, because we had that in, in, in a different agreement here in Asia in the CPTPP, even worse in, Asia, in RCEP though is a footnote that goes on top of those exceptions that says, countries get to decide for themselves what constitutes an, an emergency and no one can argue. So if I declare that data cannot move because of my personal concerns about security, health, you name it, whatever, public morals, whatever my, my issue is, I get to decide and you don't get to argue with me. So that is a huge missed opportunity in our set. It, it came about and it's, it's not a really, a, it's disappointing, but it's not a surprise because if you think about who's in our set, you know, we had to deal with Vietnam, which has a cybersecurity law that is a real challenge. We have Indonesia that is extraordinarily protectionist on data at the moment, and then China. So Ch China actually didn't say anything in RCEP really because the others did it for them. But you know, we have different views on the importance of data flows. And um, I think that's a problem in RCEP. It's, it's not a 
I'm hoping, not a catastrophic issue because um, only countries that want to use the exception will use the exception. Hopefully most of them don't. They see the benefits. They understand that you know investment as an example comes when you don't have exceptions like that. Um, so we'll see how well it lasts. And then it will be, I'm assuming, changed over time as data becomes more crucial. And as you discover that more and more things in your life don't work without data, including, you know, I don't know, your refrigerator doesn't decide to order groceries from whoever delivers it to you. I mean, which is where we're gonna be not too long from now. And if you didn't have data flows for that, you won't get it to happen for you. And so eventually I think RCEP will change this rule or at least tighten the restriction or eliminate it altogether. But for now, it is one of the weaknesses of the agreement is that particular section. There are other digital things, just before I finish here and make it sound horrible. There are some digital rules that are helpful. So for example, Finally, we started to get some digital rules in a big trade agreement on things like intellectual property. So how do you deal with IP rules in the digital space, which that's always contentious with some, some governments and some individuals who really don't want to expand intellectual property rights over anything else. But in the digital space, we gotta do something. We're all, we're all copying and pasting things back and forth. And so you know we gotta have some rules that make sense in today's economy. So there's some digital rules there. There's digital services rules. We got a little bit on the on the customs and, and trade facilitation, but we didn't get, especially those two big ones on data flows, which is a missed opportunity. I, I thank you very much for that. And, um, and I've got a few questions coming in from the audience now, so I, I will ask them, but I think um, this data side of things, it's not just about the data flows, it's about data ownership, isn't it? So, I mean, there is actually a very nationalist agenda within there as well, which is, the nations themselves want to own the information that belongs with it to their citizens effectively. So there's a lot of complexity around who owns, who owns the data, who owns the, and, and who actually controls that data as well. So it's, well, it's, 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 it's a big issue. It's interesting that you say that because one of the things that I've been working on a lot this week, in addition to dealing with questions on RCEP is exactly this, this, this point on a concept that is now beginning to rise up called digital or data sovereignty, where some governments really think that we need to have rules or restrictions for the purposes of being sovereign over data. So I, I think it comes, it, it, as I sort of unpack this, I think it comes from the very flawed view that someone started ages ago, that data is the new oil. And so if data is like oil, then I should own it. And if it comes in my ground, then it should be mine and I should have exercise sovereignty over it. But this is deeply problematic for a borderless digital world. And so trying to figure out, this has been my mission this week, anyone who has help from me, please let me know. Mission this week is to figure out, particularly in India, just because that happens to be the space in which I'm, I'm sitting at the moment and I was thinking about it, what are the policies that India has towards data and digital sovereignty? It's one of the reasons they left RCEP. And what does that mean in practical terms? Like what are the things that you would as a policymaker shove into the digital sovereignty basket and then say, we can't possibly do fill in the blank what because it's a sovereignty issue. And then if that spreads, then what happens to the digital economy? What happens to supply chains and global value chains going forward? What happens to most of our companies and the work that we do if in fact you can't move information? And this becomes deeply problematic. So data sovereignty, digital sovereignty, this, this term is um, a challenge. Uh, let me at least put it that, it's a challenge going forward. <laughs> And, and it links so much to sovereignty as sovereignty and ownership and nationalism as well. And so a question coming in now back to Europe, um, and, and maybe either Andy or Joanna, this is one for you. France has national procurement and ownership rules restricting non-French ownership of strategic assets and we know that Germany has been doing the same thing this is deep nationalism all of a sudden isn't it Germany never had policies like that France 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 has but Germany has always had fairly fairly um, different rules so a lot of it isn't new it could have employment and wealth creation benefits but does it does it actually push us back to a position where you know instead of saying it doesn't matter whether the company is British or German we're now saying actually it deeply does matter that it's British or German. On the newness of, of these things um, the, the, the EU's mechanism for this is brand new um, but of course it's not new to know which about 
the strategic assets and where they exist and to worry about whether um, operating them needs to, to remain in some sense connected to a policy um, framework in country. I think one of the things to note is that a bit like the use of um, section 232 to suddenly apply tariffs on steel and aluminium, these are things that have, have been latent in the, the system that are suddenly being used and that we've got to think about why that is and the, the it's the use of them that is uh, new and the use of them all in one direction which is to to close up and to raise barriers I think is new uh, the, the 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 loss of that consensus that it would might it might be a good idea for, to have someone else come and operate uh, uh, very efficiently your your asset you know that that it sounds horribly naive to say it now but that that was uh you know the way that the system was set up um that openness could be a good thing and it, it now doesn't seem like that's so much of a given anymore and Landy, maybe I could I could say ask you to come in and comment on another question, which is very similar, which is South Korea um, had has has protectionist would say that protectionist policies are actually really good to protect rapid industrialization. So maybe we've all gone back to that sort of 1970s mantra where we need to have these borders, we need to protect because there are countries around the world that genuinely need to be protected, to protect their infant industries, if you like, while they grow. And similarly, um, you know, the great the great argument of the last few months has been, or last few years has been, let's protect American jobs, let's make sure that American jobs are safe. So um, I think, you might like to comment on that degree of protectionism as well, because it is this industrial policy again, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and look, you know, we have um, CVI has teams in in US, China, and India, uh, and actually India is the one that you know, has really kind of um, escalated this uh, in the last year or so. Uh, going back to Deb's point, it's you know, um, you know, this this kind of make in India uh, mantra. Um, uh, to try and get India onto kind of the, or up the, the value chain globally um, really has kind of shifted um, the, the ability of kind of foreign investors to come in um, and, um, you know, to, to uh, export to India um, and to, um, you know, uh, not necessarily just, just invest there. Um, will we see more of these sort of measures is the question. I, th I, th I think probably we will. Um, and um, it, it depends whether they're going to be in strategic assets or whether um, we're going to see this, um, you know, a, a, akin to India, um, looking for as a core kind of economic policy, industrial policy going forward. Um, I agree with Joanna. It's, you know, it is kind of contrary to the, the age old mantra of, of uh, welcoming competition. Uh, you know, improving productivity and, and improving innovation, uh, which which kind of built the, the system that we know today. Um, but I think one thing that COVID has shown is the economic system uh, that we are all used to, this kind of market capitalism uh, is broken uh, and needs to be rethought uh, with the pressures of, of other economic models such as China's uh, coming through. So um, thank you. So Ian, I have a question for you from the audience. Um, <laughs> how much of traditional banking systems about to collapse? Um, how much is <laughs> just in one minute? I love this question. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Um, so um, with I, I'm going to read it out with new market entry of digital Juan on Belt and Road initiatives, such as infrastructure and trade. Does COVID promote, promote a new security threat from further new digitized currencies? Will the pandemic further create to shift towards use of cryptocurrency, offering an ability to bypass the dollar's position. You have one minute to talk without hesitation, <laughs> repetition or deviation. <laughs> it's a great question because the debate on crypto, um, certainly for the past uh, two, three years, the regulatory conversation about crypto it, in so many ways folds together uh, so much of what we've been talking about, economic security, protectionism, who controls uh, what. And, you know, the fact that, you, you know, you now really do have uh, major um, uh, global regulators like the Bank of England, like the Fed in particular, 
doing incredibly detailed work on this, as opposed to where we were two, three years ago, which was, no, absolutely not. You know, this is a danger um, in every sense to the structure of our economies. We need a fiat currency. We can't go anywhere near this stuff. And the whiff of, well, you know, um, actually it would put, um, it would put, uh, uh, it would put our economies in jeopardy. All of that has kind of gone out the window. In fact, I mean, to um, to go on for slightly longer than a minute, but I mean, a debate I think you were touching on um, uh, in in uh, your question as well, Rebecca, around um, uh, you know mo modern monetary theory, uh, however you want to uh, describe that. I mean, that is of course a political opportunity to keep the taps open for an indefinite period, but. You know, nobody necessarily from a policymaker uh, perspective is completely confident that, that this is the right way uh, to go right now. Um, look, what, what have we seen um, uh, through COVID? We've certainly seen central banks lean much more to the incumbents than to the new entrants. They've lent in towards the incumbents to lend and to use the existing plumbing to lend to particularly uh, SME businesses. And, you know, there's been quite a lot of, um, I would say quite kind of calcified recidivist thinking in, in uh, some uh, finance ministries, which is to say, no, we're not, you know, FinTech, uh, things like crypto are, are not necessarily the solution, but my hunch, is that that's a first wave effect. That is a first wave effect. There's a long way to go uh, with um, the economic recovery story, um, a, a very long way to go with the economic recovery story. And I think that policymakers are gonna increasingly just want to have different tools, which is why that chink of light around um, developing crypto um, is, is now firmly within the kind of policymaker uh, uh, kind of conversation. Thank you. Now, I promised everyone an opportunity um, to to discuss or at least say what they thought we would be talking about at a future of strategy event in a year's time. Um, and how are we going to get there? And I think the how are we going to get there is the most important part of all of this. What are we going to need to do over the next year to get to where you want to be um, in terms of economics, trade and geopolitics? Um, and, and Ian, um, when we come to you, um, I think I can't help but ask you, can, can Brexit, is Brexit going to make a difference to your answer? But Joanna, let's start with you. Oh, I think we will be talking about Brexit next year. Um, but, I, um, but hopefully we'll be talking about uh, newly fortified rules-based or world order <laughs> where, where uh, the US has um, made strides back into cooperation. There's an appellate body at the WTO functioning, new director general at the WTO functioning, and a reform agenda. And, um, and voices are speaking up in favor of, of, of international trade for its own sake, for, for economic welfare point of view. Thank you, Andy. Um, what Joanna said. Uh, so no, I, I, I think the, the, um, uh, the US agenda uh, is going to be front and center, what, what Biden does uh, and, and how he responds to, to China uh, is, is obviously going to be key. Um, WTO, 100% um, and, and kind of how that is, is shaping the international agenda. UK perspective, uh, G7 presidents next year, again, opportunity to collaborate with um, uh, with the US, uh, CBI, uh, we co-host the Business 7, which is one of the, the five or six kind of advisory bodies. Um, so again, big opportunity for business to kind of uh, influence and be a part of the solution there. Um, COP26, again, you know, huge opportunity. Um, and then yeah, two, two other things. One, vaccine distribution. What that happens to, to kind of have, particularly for inclusive growth, uh, and inclusive growth has so many geopolitical levels to it. We'll, we could talk all day on that. Uh, and then what we're just talking about in terms of finance and, and crypto. Um, 
one, one of the things which uh, talking about G7 and B7 next year, we've started thinking about is um, if you look at where, where digital taxation was, that probably that conversation started in 2013 at the last UK G7 presidency in the three T's agenda we had back then. It took four or five years to really that to come a mainstream conversation. What are the conversations we want to have in 2021, thinking ahead to you know 2028? Uh, and that's really something that we're, we're turning our mind to a little bit now. Thank you, Debbie. Your well, this future is of something I. This is not something I want to talk about, but in a year we will be talking much more seriously about subsidies, uh, because coming out of COVID and part of the economic recovery will be a lot of money in a lot of places that will have competitiveness challenges, and so. A year from now, it will be all about subsidies and whether or not we can resolve some of the disputes because we have really very few rules. Uh, and so I think that is going to be on the agenda by the end of next year. Um, no matter what happens, no matter who's in power, that's going to be part of the agenda. Thank you. Ian, last word to you. Brexit, life, the universe and everything. Um, OK, uh, agree with all of the above. Um, and. Uh, bouncing back better i.e can biden do it if he can do that then we you know there's the start to be able to shift away from populism into a conversation about a new and fit for purpose uh, global uh, world order again if america is not bouncing back better then uh, the jury's out on that uh, brexit is for life it's not just for christmas so you know, I'm gearing up to work on this for a very, very long time. If we get a deal, that's a good starting point to move on. If we don't get a deal, the political mud uh, will, will, will sling. And given my accent, you know where I'm going with this. Keep your eyes on Hollywood. Um, Andy lays out a very, very exciting uh, prospect for the UK during the G7. But if Scotland votes for a majoritarian SNP government, we will see what we saw in 2012, 2013, and 2014. It will overwhelm the UK government, and the prospect of Scotland leaving the UK um, is real, and the UK's ability to be part of these conversations will not be as powerful. On that cheerful note, um, I have to say I agree with all of the above and particularly uh, the point on the power of the UK um, outside, of, outside of these very large trading blocks that are beginning to emerge, um, particularly if Scotland leaves. I can only thank my panel here absolutely enormously. It's been a brilliant discussion. Uh, we've been all around the world in 80 minutes, just about um, 60 minutes. Um, and it's it's been very stimulating indeed. We've had some fantastic engagement from the audience as well. Thank you very, very, very much indeed for taking part in our Future of Strategy event. Thank you. Thank you.